Uh, welcome, everybody. This is the rescheduled uh, Thursday night webinar scheduled for, uh, it was actually a Tuesday night, uh, July 2nd, 2019, because we have the Independence Day holiday, July 4th on Thursday. So we had to move this uh, uh, webinar normally on Thursdays up a couple of days. So, uh, But it will be the same pretty much uh, content of what that web webinar would have been. So let's get the uh, disclaimer out of the way. All communications from trading systems are for educational purposes only. Futures trading does involve risk, and there is a risk of loss. Nothing contained in this webinar or other webinars, including the live trading room, are can, to be uh, considered as investment or trading advice. And, of course, everybody in here does know that you do trade at your own sole discretion. Okay, so what we were talking about in the um, pre-webinar session was a couple of things. Um, the first one is uh, how many how many charts uh, people ha uh, traders have up, and uh, there were quite a few who typed in ones and twos. So for those of you who look at one or two charts, um, I would I would uh, I would sort of give you, if you will. Uh, a kudos a gold star and say maybe you know if it's working out for you stick with what you got um, and for those of you that typed in a three or four or more charts you really need to cut that back to one or two okay I'm, I'm just not gonna mince words about it um, because four is too many um, now if you if you come back and you say well I have you know I have four huge flat screens and I've got you know multiple Google screens and I I've been trading four charts for years and I'm making a ton of money in four charts well then more power to you stick with what you got but more often than not what we find is that traders who have more than two tend to suffer from a couple of things first of all they wind up getting in late they wind up missing trades they're distracted you're trading sim on one thing, you hear a call on something else, you're chasing it. If you, you, you got to find one or two instruments, two at the absolute most, especially if you fall into the somewhat newer to mid-range experience trader. If you're a new to mid-range trader, mid m medium amount of experience, if you if you fall into the expert category, you've been doing this a while and you're making a ton of money every morning, and you can handle three or four charts, by all means continue to do so. Don't change what you're doing if that's you. On the other hand, if you're missing trades and you're getting in late, um, you're missing calls, you can't put lines on charts, everything, you're always kind of behind the eight ball, you got to narrow it down to really focusing on one or two. Now, there was a question earlier in the room, and I don't, I, I don't know if we got to it today, but I'm just going to say this. Um, and it was a question, and I think it was somebody that was new that said something to the effect of, "If I'm completely new, what should I look at?" And I would, I would say on the equity side. By the way, if you if, let me just back up a second, there are some of you that are just completely new. So what you're looking at here is we at Viper Trading Systems um, trade the futures markets intraday. So we start trading uh, in the morning around 6, 6.30 when the uh, crude pit opens and the equity markets open in the U.S. Generally, our room is done by about 8 o'clock-ish. So that's an you know, hour and a half, two hours in the morning. And, and by the end of the trading session, which is at 1.15, you really want to be out by 1 o'clock. Uh, my time, 1,300, which just to show you on this chart, is right here. We are flat. We never hold positions overnight. We don't want to be subject to uh, overnight uh, you know, tweets, news information, things that come up around the world. Uh, plus, the margin just goes through the sky. If you hold positions through that close period from 115 to 130, they kick you into an overnight um, leverage situation, and it's usually not good. <laughs> so really, you know, you you want to be flat by the close. Uh, you, that, and now that being said, uh, after 130 my time, 430 Eastern, you can start trading again because you're back to the intraday margin. 
okay? And you can trade all, all the way over through the Asian and European sessions through midnight my time. Let's go over and look at that today. Now we trade um, four uh, markets in the live trading room. We trade crude oil in the live room. A lot of good movement on crude oil. Is that something you should, could do as a newbie? Yes. It's $10 a tick. Um, if you're going to learn on crude, you, you really have to, 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 you know, focus on crude um, because it has a lot of movement. You can make a lot of money, but you can get bit pretty hard too. ES is another market we have in the live room. Now, this is the E-mini S&P. It's fairly highly liquid. Million and a half contracts a day, twelve fifty a tick. All the equities are on the September expiration contract. We just rolled them from June. Uh, and um, you want one word about ES real quick here. Like here is ES this morning. Let me just orient you real quick to uh, so you know what you're looking at here. Um, uh, Six o'clock Pacific when Gary opens the room was right about here. And the equity market's open here at 630. Now you can see here, I'll take these predictors off real quick here. Um, you know, ES was in a pretty, you know, tight, choppy, funky range until it finally broke up here about 7.30, and then it only went up about, I don't know, looks like 68 to 73, five times four, 15, 20 ticks. You probably got a scalp off, and then they gave up the ghost. So, you know, I don't know that ES would, would want to be in your bag of tricks. Uh, you might want to also take a look at the Russell RTY. Yeah, Aspen, I see that. I, several people ask that question. If I'm new, what should I start with? So right now, what's on the table is crude oil. Um, you know, you should really start to acquaint yourself with a crude chart because you get normally anywhere from 100 to 200 ticks of movement in a day, which means that there's a lot of movement up and down for you to make money. Let me get a Russell chart up here. The Russell, like oil, has a lot of movement on it, too. Um, sometimes it's whippy. you got to learn that about it. It can be a little um, uh, moody, if you will, in its, in its price action, its movement. Um, other days, it's really smooth. Here's the Russell chart right here. We'll talk about some trades on Russell in, in a little bit here. I just want to show the chart. This is the Russell. This is the opening of the Russell market. It's way over here. Now, don't get me wrong. Look, you know, after the open, Russell can be choppy too. Here's a choppy area on the Russell right here. Here's the open right here at 630, right here. Dropped off, and then you chopped around, and then tried to find some direction. So it was, it was a, you know, it was a tough day on the Russell. You know, and here's the thing. If you just say to yourself, I'm going to trade two markets, you can start off and say, okay, I'm going to try to trade Russell and crude. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to trade crude and ES. And then if you find that ES is in a funky chop, you don't want to deal with it, you can switch, you know, give it 15, 20 minutes, switch to something else. Uh, another one you can look at is gold. GC, also $10 a tick of movement. Uh, on the August contract, we're going to get ready to roll that pretty soon to, uh, I think it's September or October, when the roll time comes up. So in that sense, those of you who are completely new, the, uh, the, the futures markets have expiration dates. So in that sense, they're a little bit akin to, uh, to options, options that have expiration uh, to them. Of course, the other factor is uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the options, you have all the you know, you beta, all the betas, all the Greeks. So there's a time there's a time element involved there where you don't have that with futures. Futures just straight up what they are. You know, you're trading what they are in, in an intra intraday basis. See, so you can look here, like overnight, you know, gold gets these little choppy areas just like any market does. And then it went into this long protracted uptrend move like this. See? See this huge, huge move up on gold. Gold's been, gold's been in a, a pretty good uptrend. Then it goes flips, it goes short. Okay, so when we're connected to our uh, data feed from our broker, Ninja Trader, um, and we have developed these indicators on the chart. So our indicators, oh, excuse me, are the um, background colors, <clears throat> the bar colors. 
the uh, the stealth line, which is the green line that follows the market up, the power meters, which are the various trends uh, on the chart, uh, OT alerts. These are uh, trades that you can set up alerts for. You can turn them on and off here, and then, of course the predictors are real-time support and resistance levels on the chart. Okay. Now I want to talk. I I I I know the topic, the subject material of this um, uh, webinar is learn three trade types. But in the pre-webinar uh, discussion, we you know I decided to change that to one trade type because I think what I'm starting to see uh, in the, in the live room is that there are lots of different trade types that are being called out on different instruments and as that happens it can be confusing you know one one's a one's a minimum criteria and next thing's a mid-band um you know deep retracements or phantoms uh is the market trending is it going sideways should i go long should i go short what's this number mean why is that line there you know, we get these questions every day, all day long, and we understand it, okay? But here's the thing. I think in order to be successful, you have to really simplify things to start. Because if you start with something complicated in a state of confusion, you're never going to be able to build a solid base to learn from, and then you're always going to be confused. Fair enough? So what I'm going to focus on today is, and we're going to look at lots of different instruments. I, I really think, you know, if, if, if the the proper trade to learn first, if you were to just corner me and say, hey, look, I just want to learn one trade, and then I want to be able to look at a couple different charts and just see it, and I just want to take it. And that's great. I would suggest it would be the mid-band trade. Now let's talk about the mid-band trade for a minute. Okay, a mid-band trade, first of all, to have a minimum criteria, deep retracement mid-band trade, a market has to be trending. Okay, let's look at examples where a mid-band trade is not appropriate and really wouldn't be a good idea. And this is what we need to know. Okay, here's an example of where a mid-band trade would not work. All right. And the reason for that is that you can clearly see in this area right here that, you know, gold was, uh, or is this gold? Yeah, this is gold. But this could be any market. It was in a tight range. And a lot of times what, what you'll find is that those tight ranges will bounce between line two and line six. So you'll get a market that might be going like that. And this happens to oil. oil it happens to everything. Okay. Now you can see clearly here that if you were, taking longs or shorting this market from the mid band which a mid band trade by definition is these two bands right here that by the time you got get to the outer edge of where support and resistance levels are there's just no meat by the time you get filled and a little slippage in commission there is no meat on the bone to take trades in here so in this case what you would do is you would put a line here and you would put a line here and you can see the 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 mid band is more or less in the middle 1417 is where that mid band sitting on this example here and you know resistance is here at 18 that's 10 ticks up support down here it's you know it's just under 16 10 ticks down and by the time you box it and get in and out there's just nothing so you really when you find consolidation areas that are say under 20 to 25 ticks that are bouncing between line one and two usually for the most part those are areas you really want to avoid Okay, especially if you're brand new. If you're brand new, you know, learning how to trade a range is important, but frankly, you know, truth be told, it's something you probably would want to learn down the road. Because if you can't nail a couple of good mid bands and catch a trend move, it's going to be hard to get to the spot where you're going to be able to nail trades in a range like that. Okay, so let's talk about what a mid band trade is. First, I'm going to define it, and then we're going to talk about different ways to take it. Because um, 
and let's just start with defining what a mid-band trade is. A mid-band trade is a trade, either long or short, that is taken in uh, um, the band uh, 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 slightly above the mid-band, the band slightly below mid-band. Obviously, this would be band four. This is band five and or bars that sit right on the mid-band itself. Okay. Now, I have to tell you the trade-off of this. The plus, the plus of learning this, this type of trade is that it happens a lot. It's very frequent. Um, if you're taking a retracement in a trend, you have a high likelihood of making money from it. Uh, I can't give you, I can't quote you an exact number, and frankly, between instruments, it would differ anyway. But it, it's a very good trade to learn. If they don't work out, normally you can get out pretty quick, and so they won't sting you too bad if you get a loser, and there's no follow through. Okay, so what? let's look at some examples of mid-band trades. Let's hold off on ta talking about taking them just for a second and just get through the concept of what they are. Here's another band where a market, in the case of gold, comes down and sits on the mid-band right here. So that would be a mid-band trade, right? Anywhere a market comes to the band above or below the mid-band, is considered a mid-band trade. These are all examples here. Now they are all not created equal. Okay. Let me show you some examples of how they can differ, and we'll talk about reasons why you should take some and reasons why you probably shouldn't take others. And it has to do with the size and the consolidation of the bars that occurs at the mid-band itself. If the bars are compact, meaning that the that you could draw a box around these bars, and the size would be, let's look at an example here. This one's the bottom of the box at 07, and the top of the box is here at 0770-ish. Top to bottom, you're around seven to eight ticks. This is a good box right here, good tight consolidation pattern. Good box to take. Let's look at this one over here. Support just under 08 at 0790 on gold. Top of the box approximately located at 0850. What is that? Five to six ticks. So a general rule for a good mid-band box trade is a maximum of 10 ticks. Okay, that's not a chiseled into granite. That's just a good rule of thumb. You know, if if you find a box like this, it's nice and tight, five, six ticks, box like this, seven, eight ticks. These are good examples of mid-band box trades that you can take that nor normally work out pretty well. Let me show you an example of a mid-band box that would not be a good idea to take. It would be something like, that looks something like this. Now, notice on this consolidation patch on gold here, that the support level is down at this 0650, 0660 ish range on the bottom, and the top is way up here at 0790. So you're looking at 13 ticks, top to bottom, plus or minus a tick or so, depending on where you actually drew the box. So you can see here this this region box mid band trade is the size is more. Now, you granted, it turned out and you got a scalp trade out of it. That will occasionally happen. But generally speaking, this would fall into a category of more like a breakout trade. And we don't, we don't take those. We don't like breakout trades. So 10 ticks and under, anything under 8 ticks is really good. And they need to be located, as I mentioned, in the band above, on the bar, it's a, a mid-band itself, the thick line in the middle of the bands, and, or the bar, one below it. Any questions on that? Okay. Let's pop another instrument up that you want to look at. What's something else that people trade here that we might want to uh, look at some trades? Say, how about crude? You want to look at crude? Show of hands, any crude traders? CL uh, crude traders in here? CL? You want to look at some crude things from today? Yes? Si, senor? Por favor? Okay, let's load up a crudy chart. The 
So, um, you know, crude oil, and let's go all the way back to the pit open here. Um, some days, like any market, you're going to have, uh, I, I trade the NASDAQ occasionally, Wilfredo. So I have four big screens. And one of the screens has a NASDAQ chart on it. And if I like the setup on it, I will take it. So I, so the answer to your question is yes. I watch NQ. Um, and if the trades, and that's, I'm, I'm really picky. You know, I love mid-band trades. I just love mid-band trades. Those are probably, that's my go-to trade pretty much every day. Let's look at some examples of mid-band trades. And let's do a, a pop uh, pop quiz for you here. Um, in fact, let me get these lines off of here. Hold on. Let's just clean this chart up for a second. There we go. There we go. Okay. And let's just do a, a yes or no session. Uh, there's a lot of bars on a four range, uh, uh, NASDAQ charge for okay. Yeah. Yeah. You could be waiting quite some time. I mean, uh, I remember when there was just these shotgun, you can get several hundred bars in just a few minutes on NASDAQ. So it's a whole different animal. I don't know that I'm, I'm going to show that because, uh, we have a lot of people visiting and new people in here. And I don't think NASDAQ is a good way to spend your time. Two part question on this one. Well, let's start with some easy ones. Let's start with some easy questions and work our way up to the more difficult material. Okay? All right. And we we don't it, now for the first sort of looking at this, I uh, we don't you don't have to call a trend or uh, a trade direction. It's just going to be a yes or no question. Okay? How about this area right here? Is this a mid-band trade? Yes or no? I'm going to give you about five seconds for each of these. So this should be something that, you know, as you look at this, it should just be something that you look at and just like, you know, if you're going to learn this appropriately, instantly know, okay, that's a yes. Boop. Why? If you don't think it's a, mid a legitimate mid-band trade, type in no. Boop. And three seconds left. Two seconds. Mid-band trade, yes or no. That's square right there. One second left. Time's up. Yes. Yes. So it meets the definition of a mid-band trade in the fact that it is in the located in the band immediately below the mid-band. Remember our criteria. Here or here or on the mid-band itself. So the answer is yes. Let's do another easy one. How about here? Is this a, would this be considered a mid-band trade? Yes or no? Five seconds. Four seconds. Just a wire and in. Either it is or it isn't. There's no maybe in it. And, you know, there's no M in this. It's a, either a wire and in. Three seconds. One second. Okay. Yes. Now, the second part of the question, I didn't want to confuse a simple yes or no answer, is um, um, is the the size of the box. Here you can clearly see that uh, this is a tight formation of uh, uh, bars under the mid-band here. That is acceptable. Just to put a couple of numbers on it real quick, top of the box is here at... Um, Roughly at 59.13. Uh, 59, the bottom is here at 08. This is roughly a five ticks box, five tick box. That's about what the width of a band is, usually about five, six ticks from top to bottom. So the, the best scenario in most most cases is that your your region box where you're going to get in using the object trader tool will will be confined to the size of one of the of one of the bands. Right? Here's another example here. So the top of the box is located at uh, 03, and the bottom's around uh, 97, six ticks. Yeah, so you're within this, the confines of the band itself, five, six ticks. Good region box, mid-band trade, good trade. 
Well, Fredo, um, it's a good question. His question is, is there a minimum number of bars to be considered a valid trade? And um, uh, the answer is no, not really. Uh, the minimum would really be one or two or three. In this case over here, it was two. Uh, in this case here, you're looking at one, two, three. Really, this would be kind of your minimums right here. You know, uh, the more consolidation you have, the better. I mean, if you have a nice tight consolidation of four, five, six, eight bars in a six tick range, that's a good trade to use a region box to get in. So uh, just to make a uh, terminology issue for those of you that might be coming in the live room and still a little bit get confused of what we're talking about. Um, and I know Gary has shown this and we have webinars that teach this. One of the tools that we've developed over the years is called Object Trader. It's a panel located on the right side of your chart over here. It looks somewhat similar to Chart Trader, only it has a ton more functionality to it. And one of the main functionality things that we have is the ability to draw these region boxes. And then when you, it's semi-automated in the fact that you can turn it on. And, um, you know, in this case here in a downtrend, you would enable short only, right? Short only. Uh, and then what happens is when a bar closes outside of the region box, so in this example, that would be this bar right here. In this example over here, it would be this bar right here. Depending on how you drew it, it would probably be that bar right there. What happens is OT, Object Trader, fires a market order on the close of that bar, and you're filled short on the close of the bar right there like that. And then depending on the size of your initial stop, you know, one or two contracts, whatever you put on there, um, you know, puts the initial stop up wherever you set it. Let's say it was 12 ticks, so it would be located up here somewhere. And then it can manage your targets and your stops. So it's it's semi-automated in the sense that once you turn on the box itself, it, it takes over from there, short or long. You see it right here? In the example of these two bo region boxes, can you see how this candle closed outside of it right here? Let's use a cursor so you can see what's going on here real quick, everybody. That bar closed at uh, 59.04. The region box was located between 08 and 13. So that's what we set at five tick tight region box just under the mid band. This is a mid band short region box trade. Filled short at 59.04. Now, just to finish the discussion here, uh, in most cases, we want to put at least two contracts on if you can. And the first contract generally comes off at either six or eight or 10 ticks. In this case, the first contract would come off here and then you engage, engage a runner with a trail stop. Okay, same thing here. You get a pop down and then you get your stop, you know, three ticks a little behind break even four ticks behind break even and then you engage a trail stop with a runner that's ideally how you do it everybody see that these are examples of mid-band shorts okay and for those of you that came in late don't worry about it we're, we're not I know you know so we kind of changed the topic here it was three trade types but we just sort of on the fly at the last minute just changed it to um, um, we're just going to show the mid-band tonight on various charts, okay, various mid-band trades. And you, if you want, on Saturday morning, because uh, Thursday we're closed because of the uh, July 4th holiday, Thursday, I mean, uh, Saturday morning, if you want, I can get into more of the other two types, okay, if we have time. But for now, we're focusing on the mid-band trade. Let's look at some examples of mid-band trades that might not be so good. Stick with me, Aspen, Wilfredo. I know there's quite a few new people in here. I want to, I, I want to, I, I I'm trying to cover a lot of material here. So if we could just, uh, I'm ask a small favor, just sort of pause the questions for a little bit here. I'm going to cover all this material and then, um, and then we can sort of power through all the questions uh, towards the end. Okay. Um, let's take a look at this uh, area right here. In fact, that might be related to your question there, Aspen. How do we feel about this box right here? Now, 
in terms of the criteria of being a mid-band trade, some of the bars are in this area right here. So from a location standpoint, you could make the case that uh, this was a mid-band trade. On the other hand, would this be something that you would want to take? Let's extend it out in the manner I've drawn it. In this manner here, that's a yes or no question, and you have five seconds on the table for you to answer it. You'd be so long on that bar right there. So your fill would come in at, uh, you know, 5906-ish long. As, a, as I have drawn the box, this would not be acceptable because the box is too big. You're probably at 13 ticks or more. Now, that being said, could you have drawn a box that looked more like this? Yes. Would you have been filled, depending on when you drew the box, let me show you some fills that we, you, you would have gotten. You could have filled possibly on that one. I'm not going to do them all. You get the idea. Anything that closed outside of it, you could have been filled on that one. And you could have put a fairly tight stop just under the mid-band right here. See the wick of the candle? And did that turn into being an okay trade? Well, you got to, at least with the tighter box, you got to scalp off. And when you see a consolidation pattern that this is this large, you would not want to box it like this. You want to box it tight or pass on it. Yeah, so let's let's do some quick math on the fills. So you'd be filled on, let's call these two candles filled at uh, at uh, 50, uh, would that be 59.97? Fill long outside the box. And let's see where the bottom of that candle fell. If it's less than 12 ticks away. What did I say, 90, 97 here? All right, so 85 would be the stop. Yeah, okay, so your stops would be 97 less 12 is 85. Yeah, so your stops would be way down here. Yeah, so it never, it, 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 if you had the tight box and you're filled on a close outside on one of these bars right here, or even that bar right there, your initial stop was down here at 85, 12 ticks below your entry, or even 10 ticks, which would be 87. You never got stopped out and you popped up for a trade. So the no-no to take away from here then on a mid-band is that you, you would, you, if you're going to take it, keep the box tight, keep your stops, and you don't have to leave your stop way down here. You can drag it way up here tighter. So, you know, maybe you're only risking like eight or nine or ten ticks. Okay. Let's look at some other examples. What else do we want to look at? Do we look at Russell Trades? Um, do we look at gold yet? I don't think we looked. What do we look at so far? We looked at crude. We just we're looking at crude right now. We had an ES chart up earlier. Let's pop gold up real quick. Gold is still on the. Uh, by the way, everybody here knows the website you check for for the latest contracts on futures uh, instruments, right? You know the CME Group. Everybody know the CME Group site. That's the de facto site for clearing on futures contracts and the trades and the current. You know, I'll just go ahead and show it real quick. Uh, group dot com I've had problems with this site. They've had a uh, kind of a hacker. I don't know why I get this sometimes, but I do. CME group dot com. Can't find it. Huh. That's really strange. Well, I'll come back to that then. Uh, okay, so this is gold. Uh, Jim asking, do we look at trades uh, with no bar color? Um, you know, let me speak to the bar color issue because um, um, occasionally that does come up. So I'd like to address it like like as follows. Um, when you're in an uptrend... Generally speaking, so let's look at a, a couple of very quick, small examples of up and down trends. So here you can see the market started to ratchet up a little bit on gold, right? 
and um, the bars will predominantly be blue, the background will be green, and your mid band and all the bands will stair step up like that when you're in an uptrend, right? Uh, when you're in a downtrend, the opposite would normally be true. Say over here in this little pop down right here, this little downtrend pop. Uh, you know, the mid band and all the bands will stair step down. Bars will predominantly be red. And the background will be red as well. Now, you may notice uh, on almost every chart that on the retracements, when the bars come back into this area right here, they tend to turn yellow. Okay, that does not mean trend change, obviously. Yellow simply means that you're getting you're into the mid-band area. Here's an example of a mid-band short. Here's another example of a mid-band short, right? Bars are turning yellow. Bars turn yellow. That's not a trend change. That's simply bars located around the mid-band. Okay? Here's another example over here. Here's an example of a mid-band box right here. It's marginally acceptable. All right? Let's look at the trend on gold for the day. Let's go back to the earlier part of the day. Where am I at here? Hold on. Give me a second. Uh, 5.30... Six. All right, here we go. Let me get you oriented real quick on a gold chart. Six o'clock Pacific when Gary opened the live room was located approximately right here on this chart. So when you start assessing markets, and let's recreate 6 a.m. Pacific, on the gold chart, the gold chart would have looked at 6 o'clock something like this. Now, if you wake up tomorrow morning and at 6 o'clock your gold chart looks like this, what is the first thing that goes through your mind? I'll give you 10 seconds to answer this. Just type in a word or two or three what your thoughts are. You wake up tomorrow morning and gold looks like this. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? What else might you do to the chart to help you get uh, form an opinion as to what to do? And this, this, you should really do this on every chart. But I'm just using gold as an example. What does this look like to you, and what should you do? Choppy. Range bound, consolidation, uh, retracements. Okay. Well, let's look at what's happening over here. And this would have been um, let's let's orient everybody because the, the the numbers are kind of small. Here's midnight Pacific time going into the morning of the second on gold. And so over here, we can see that, excuse me, let's try to get everybody oriented real quick right here. Here's the close of the, of the American U.S. session. So going into the close yesterday, excuse me, gold was in a little bit of a downtrend, right? So you were looking for shorts. And this was yesterday into the close. Now between here and over here, this is what we call the Asian trading session. So all the banks in Hong Kong throughout Asia are trading gold futures. They trade in this time frame right here. So this is their morning over there, right? Can you see that? So it was down during the day. This is yesterday. Down during the day yesterday. And then they had to deal with a little bit of chop. But you could make the case that even though it was choppy, it looked like you could didn't take that bottom out, and it almost sort of start looked like it wanted to make a little uptrend move there, right? Asian trading session. Now here's midnight Pacific time, so we're going into the European session. 
So the big banks in London and what have you are all, you know, throughout Europe are trading gold futures. They're trying to get their pound of flesh out of the market. And there comes 6, 630. 630 is actually right over here, more like this. This is the uh, European session which actually closes at 8.30 Pacific. I'm just showing you until when the U.S. market opens. There's your scrunch chart, Wilfredo. Now, so it's pretty clear, I think, that, uh, you know, it looked like, you know, it looked like they were trying to recover some of the sell-off from the day before in the Asian session, and then and then more or less in the, in the European session after midnight right in here. You started to get pretty choppy and sideways. Now, now, could you? Do you think it's a prudent move, in your opinion, to put a line at where we think resistance is, and maybe a line down here where we think support is? Let me change that color to yellow. It'll be a lot better, to easier to see. It was yellow when I changed it to navy. I don't know why I did that. I think yellow is a lot easier to see. Stands out. Here we go. Let's go back to yellow. Let's make it three ticks wide. And make that the default. There we go. Is that better to easier to see? Right? So do you think tomorrow morning it might be a good idea that if you see a market like crude or gold or whatever you're trading, when you get up and you start looking at your charts, might it be a prudent move to put lines if you're in a range at the top and bottom? You think you might find that helpful? Sure. Yes, of course. Now, when we said earlier and we had a discussion about this, when we said that we're range bound like this, when maybe a 20 or 25 or 30 tick range, technically that could be tradable. However, would it be prudent in this area, in your opinion, collectively here tonight as a team, all of you in here, to take mid-band trades? Would mid-band trades, when you're looking at a range like this, and this was all the way from midnight till six, so six hours in this range, it was pretty clear to put a line here and a line here, right? You think, five seconds on the clock for this question. Do you think mid-band trades are prudent in a condition like this? Yes or no? Four seconds left. Just put, type in a Y or an N. Cast your vote, team. Our mid-band trade's a good idea. If you were a uh, late bird, early bird, trading the European session and the market looked like that. <clears throat> Our mid-band trades appropriate and tight ranges when the mid band is in the middle remember we and some of you might have come in and missed that we said that probably like five ten minutes into into our little session here yeah of course the answer is time's up the answer is no yeah you do michael i get that question all the time i love it tell you what let's recreate it now the comment we get all the time is things like this well you wouldn't have known it at the time okay let's find out In fact, let me do this. Let me take let me take that off. And let me take this off. And let me take this off. All right. Now here you are. You're an you're an early bird, and you're up at uh, I don't know three four o'clock Pacific. This would be six or what would that be? Three hours six or seven a.m. Eastern. You're an early bird. And you see a market looks like this. Is it possible to still put lines on the chart? Here, let's go back even more. Here you are at 147. Could you put lines here? You can't put lines there? You couldn't you couldn't realistically put a line right there like that? And you couldn't put a line right here like this? Right? Yeah, of course you could. All right. Well, let's extend that thinking out further. Here we go. We're going out further. 
Now these lines don't stay fixed forever. Here we're now coming up on 5 a.m. Pacific, so we're about five hours into the session. Could you just take your, your line and adjust it up a few ticks a little bit like that maybe? And can you take this one and maybe go down a couple sticks because the, the support's now down here, right? There's five o'clock. We're six. There's 5.30. There's 5.43. There's six o'clock. You wouldn't even have to really move this line. I mean, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with having another support line here. Right? So you get resistance hasn't changed much at 97. Here's resistance just under the, the mid band here at 94. And below there, just slightly down from there around 93. Now, here you are at 630. Could you have drawn these lines in the pre-market session or even when 630 came along itself? And would you know at this point in time that you were range bound and that mid-band trades were probably not a good idea at this point in time? Would you know that? Yes or no? So that was the question. The question we get, and I love this question because we get it all the time, is how would you know in real time at the time it happened that you were in a range and you shouldn't take these types of trades? Well, we just did it. In fact, truth be told, could you not do the same thing, all of you collectively as a team and those of you listening on the recording, the exact same thing on your charts tomorrow morning? When you wake up and you're looking and assessing a chart, could you not put lines where support resistance are? And could you also take it a step further and make the case that as long as you remain within the confines of these lines, you are said to be range bound? Is that not true? Yes, of course it is. You need these lines. Everybody in here, this would be another takeaway that I can make a suggestion for everybody if, you, if you'd like to heed suggestions. Uh, this evening is Gary puts lines on charts because he's been doing it for so long and he does it for the benefit of everybody in the room, right? But if you're going to trade gold or if you're going to trade crude or some other chart on your screen, might you want to develop the skill set to have lines for yourself? Yeah, of course. Would it help you see and make assess conditions like this, like range bound and trend and what have you of course and would you know to stay out of certain trades and even if you took them you'd know where to get out either long or short because you now you know where support and resistance are yes so drawing lines is extremely important before we run out of time I'm going to say I'm going to recap and then we're going to look at a couple closing trades so the first thing we talked about and I see people had to leave too so this is recorded everybody will get this in the, both the subscriber area as well as on the public web for everybody to uh, listen to. Okay, so the first thing we talked about is to limit, these are uh, uh, probably in order of importance, but let's just go ahead and start with this one. Limit your charts slash instruments to no more than one or two, with two being the max. What was number two that we talked about? In terms of learning trades, in the beginning, we should look to do what? Focus. We'll just let's put the caveat in here so it's clear, and I'm not going to mince the words on this here. In the beginning, as you are learning, we should try to focus mainly on what type of trades. I put an M in here. There you go, Aspen. You got it. In the beginning, as we're learning, we should try to focus mainly on something that starts with an M. What would I type in here to finish this? Some of you already typed it in. So we want to perfect our mid-band trade skills, yes? 
Another important thing to learn for ourselves as we see charts in front of us on our own screens. And by the way, and, and, uh, I'm just uh, uh, I say this once in a while, but um, here let me just put it on here real quick. Um, we need to a critical skill to learn is learn how to draw or place lines on your charts. These are support right here. I'll just put it in here so you know support and resistance lines. Yeah, resistance lines on your charts. So inherently, by doing these three things, so let me get rid of some. Of, let me get rid of a couple of these lines. So I, this is really important stuff if you really want to learn and get good at this. I'm gonna take that out. I'm gonna take this out too, real quick here. There we go. So there's a couple of accomplishments that will come out of this exercise. If, if you think about number one, numbers one and two, by limiting the amount of charts and instruments that you're looking at to one or two, inherently you will, you will uh, take a big step towards preventing over trading because you're going to be looking at less charts. If you're used to looking at three or four or more charts, the confusion level will go way down because you're not trying to chase things around. Okay, you're going to stop missing trades. You can get focused on one or two instruments and just try to make those work. And, and experiment with the different instruments till you find one you like or two you like. Okay, Number one is really important to your success. Number two, another thing that's going to cut down your trading uh, in the beginning is focusing more initially on just taking those mid-band trades and getting really good at them. Okay, so... Let's do let's do a little for instance all together here, okay? Let's suppose that you have your two instruments, and one of them is Russell and one of them's crude. And you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to trade Russell and I'm going to trade crude, and I'm only going to look for mid-band trades on those two instruments. Cool. All right. Well, then all of a sudden, someone in the room makes a call on ES. Should you take it? Yes or no? You're trading Russell and oil. And all of a sudden, you're only trading Russell and oil in our example, okay? And a gold trade call comes in. A gold short trade comes in. Now, we have a term for that, and it takes a little bit of learning, okay? This will take a little bit of time to learn this. It's called selective listening. Selective listening is where you've trained yourself to... Uh, Ignore trades that aren't relevant to what you're doing. So inherently, that's also going to cut your trading back, right? It's going to help you stop over trading. That's right, Dennis. Ignore all the others. Louis, Phil K., yes, exactly. If it isn't pertinent to what you're looking at, then your ears t should ignore it. And number three, this is really important. These three are just top A, one, two, three right here. Okay, number three, really learn how to put some good lines on your charts. And you see it didn't take that long to do it, right? You look where there's predominant area of swing levels. You know, look, these lines aren't going to be perfect. You're going to be in an area of where it looks like support and resistance are. It's never perfect. It's an area of where it looks like support and resistance are. Okay, that's that's you just got to get something there like a line. Learn how to do that, and then what you can do is you look at where you put your lines, and then see where Gary put his lines, and see if they're close. So the room is the room there to tell you every single trade you should take in the morning, or is it prudent for you to learn how to take trades yourself? And when you hear a call in the room, it confirms what you've already seen yourself. That's an A or a B question, right? A, the room is there to tell you what to do with your trades every morning, A. B, you should really learn how to take trades yourself on your own charts. And when you hear a call in the room, it confirms what you already know you should be doing, B. And then we're going to wrap. B, right. So that's what we get a lot. You know, we, we especially when we get new uh, traders come in to to join us or kick the tires or 
you know, open house or free, you know, they're in the rooms trying to look, figure out what's going on is, you know, why don't you have a dome up? Why aren't you telling us where to get it? Why don't you do this and that in the trade? And where's your trade? Where'd you get filled? Blah, blah, blah. Really? <laughs> I mean, is that what the room's for? Shouldn't you really? I mean, the fact of the matter is a lot of times by the time we say we try as much as in real time to show it. But a lot of these times, these markets like Russell go up and kiss the mid-band and roll over. Should you know to take it? Yes. We say it. Should you have already known it? I mean, why do we spend hundreds of hours teaching? If we didn't do any teaching, we would just go in the room and spood feed everything, right? We would just catch the fish and hand them to you. Uh, Aspen, last question. Do you randomly choose two charts that you like? Um, so what you would probably want to do as you're figuring out what you want to do is start with, um, uh, a chart or two that you think you're going to like. Yeah, Louie, you're right. You can even use the lightning indicator to draw the lines and would help you. He says for him, that helped him a lot. Uh, Gary can show you in the morning in the live room if you don't know how to do that. Now, here's the one last thing I'd like to say on this is you have the micro contracts. If you have your own trading account through Ninja and or you have a one-up evaluation account, you can use the micros. The micros are one-tenth of the normal. So whereas the Russell normally would be $5 per tick of movement, the M2K, which is the micro of it, is only 50 cents. Now, I've said this several times before, if you're going to only make 50 cents per tick, are you necessarily focused on making a ton of money with the micros? Not necessarily. Could it help you transition between uh, sim trading and live trading by not risking a lot of money on MES and MGC and MNQ and MNY, all these micros? One tenth, 50 cents, buck, buck and a quarter. Could it help you transition instead of losing $120, maybe you lose $12? Would that help on the issue of the pressure of learning? Yes, of course. That's why they created them. All right. I'm going to wrap. I'm going to turn off. Uh, I'm going to turn off the recorder. I will continue this. Uh, these topics on Saturday.